Horror in video games has had quite the history, dating all the way back to the early days of Atari with games like Haunted House and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and even going further back into the early 70s with the original Haunted House and Hunt the Wumpus if you want to go real retro. The 80s had some horror themed games that really took off on the NES with games like the first few Castlevania games and Friday the 13th. But there was one little game that came out for the Famicom in Japan in 1989 that would be the catalyst for everything to change in the horror genre for video games. And that game was called Sweet Home, from a developing company known as Capcom. Sweet Home is a Japanese horror role-playing game where you play as a group of five filmmakers who go to a spooky mansion where they encounter supernatural horrors. It's actually a bit tedious to play, as you are constantly navigating five different people around this mansion, where their different strengths can be utilized. And if someone dies, they stay dead. I tried to play through this, but I didn't end up making it very far. But Sweet Home was the grandfather for what would become my favorite video game series of all time, the Resident Evil series. With it currently hovering around 30 games, give or take, and spanning over four decades, Resident Evil is the 14th best-selling video game franchise of all time, at least at the time of me writing this. Currently above franchises like The Legend of Zelda, Madden, and Star Wars. It is arguably the most popular horror video game franchise that exists, also spawning a movie series, for better or for worse, a reboot, for better or for worse, a television show, for better or for... yeah, you get the idea as well as novels, animated films, comics, merchandise, all that stuff. It's no joke. And I would like to talk about it. Every single game. My channel name of Paraspector is a combination of Parasect from Pokemon and Spectre from the James Bond series, but even both of those are still below Resident Evil for me when it comes to gaming. So I want to take you on a journey where we'll look at all of them in release order. This will be along the lines of my usual style, where we'll look at the box art, some of the instruction manuals, development and history, some ratings, sales, my opinions, and of course, some early gameplay. This is... Resident Evil. Resident Evil. Resident Evil. Resident Evil. Resident Evil. Resident Evil. Resident. 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 Resident Evil 5. So Sweet Home was the actual groundwork for what inspired video game designer Shinji Mikami seven years later. Shinji Mikami was hired to create a remake of Sweet Home, now meant for the Super Nintendo, but the idea to make it for Sony's PlayStation eventually became the goal instead. He was just told to make a horror game taking place in a mansion. Mikami's mentor, Takuru Fujiwara, who directed Sweet Home, was set to be the producer of this remake. But when Capcom no longer held the rights to Sweet Home, Mikami and Fujiwara had to come up with new characters and a new universe while maintaining the scary mansion concept. They wanted to carry over some ideas from Sweet Home, such as limited inventory space, notes and scribblings found throughout the game, puzzles, lots of backtracking, characters who can die resulting in different endings, and of course, a load screen with a door slowly opening into darkness. What they were coming up with was really like a Sweet Home remake, just with different characters, but it was no longer an RPG either. Shinji Mikami was not a fan of horror, but he felt that this helped him to know what was going to be scary based on what scared him. So he took elements from movies like The Shining for having the setting be somewhat like the Overlook Hotel, a large spooky building with lots of rooms and hallways. Dawn of the Dead inspired him to use zombies, and he loved the idea of using explosive weaponry to take down monstrous creatures, just like Brody exploding the oxygen tank in the shark's mouth in Jaws. The idea for fixed camera angles were taken right from the early 90s computer horror series Alone in the Dark, which helped steer the game away from being in the first person like the Doom series was. Having fixed cameras helped to make backgrounds look more real, as they could use pre-rendered images, almost like the characters and objects being on paintings. So it was time to create some of the characters. Shinji Mikami and Isao Hoishi wanted to create a tough guy character to be one of the playable options. Thus, 25-year-old Chris Redfield was created to be one of the members of STARS, or Special Tactics and Rescue Service, sometimes known as Rescue Squad. For the second character, they wanted a female protagonist to be on par or as close to Chris. 
They didn't want her to be objectified or weak, and thus Jill Valentine was created. But anyway, this finalized game known as Biohazard was completed and released on March 22nd, 1996 for the PlayStation. As Capcom was unable to trademark the name Biohazard for an English localization, they eventually went with the name Resident Evil, since the game takes place in a mansion. This English version was released on April 1st, and then in Europe on August 16th. So let's check out this box art. It's honestly pretty rough looking, featuring a man holding a giant gun with shadows and spiders around him. There's some debate as to whether or not this is Chris Redfield or Bravo team member Richard Aiken, as the first issue of the Marvel Comics issue has the same cover and starts off telling the story of Richard before Alpha Team shows up. The cover isn't as terrible as something like the original Mega Man cover, also a Capcom game, but this is still pretty bad. Look at that face. But instead of going over the back of the box, I want to go to the manual instead, pretending we know nothing about this game or the series. I'll be doing this each time, so if you just want to get to the game, skip to here. I think it's interesting to look back at this though, and I won't go through the entire thing, just the setup and characters. We're given a top secret mission police report for the Raccoon Forest, where we learn the names of the Alpha Team. Weapons Specialist Barry Burton, Vehicle Specialist Joseph Frost, Marksman Chris Redfield, Machine Expert Jill Valentine, Pilot Brad Vickers, and Mission Leader Albert Wesker. Our mission background says, New members of Alpha Team arrive in Raccoon City late in day. Earlier, strange reports come in from locals about missing people and unusual sightings of dog-like monsters. The mangled remains of a woman hiker are fished out of river. The police report notes that something powerful had got hold of her, judging by the depth of teeth marks. Most likely a grizzly or wolf attack. So the events taken were that the mountain road entrance was barricaded, Stars was contacted and informed that the hiker was in a tourist group, and that Stars will join the search for more missing hikers. However, contact was lost from the Bravo team after the engine failed and the helicopter went down. The Bravo team consists of Richard Aiken, Rebecca Chambers, Edward Dewey, Enrico Marini, Forrest Spire, and Kenneth J. Sullivan. So our orders are to investigate the Raccoon Forest area, locate Bravo team's helicopter, and rescue the members and bring situation under control. And to be safe. A pretty interesting setup. We learn the names of everybody and exactly what's going on and what we need to do. The last part of the manual gives a little summary of each character in alphabetical order by their last name. Barry Burton is a former SWAT member and Chris's old friend with over 16 years of experience. He supplies the weapons, is trusty, but has had some problems with his wife and daughters lately, which may make him sound depressed. Joseph Frost was recently promoted to Alpha Team and acts as the vehicle specialist. He's young, enthusiastic, and curious, and was personally promoted by Albert Wesker. Chris Redfield was kicked out of the Air Force, but joined STARS after meeting Barry. He's a tough guy with strong vitality and can handle his weapons if he gets surrounded. Jill Valentine is intelligent and has saved the lives of STARS members in the past. She's excellent with lockpicks, has strong moral convictions, and has a great capacity for holding items, but is at a disadvantage with small vitality. Brad Vickers is a computer expert, but has been given the nickname of Chicken Heart due to his strong fear of dying. He's the Alpha Team pilot. And finally, Albert Wesker is the cool guy leader with a short haircut and snappy shades. He has a sharp insight and is the founder of the STARS unit. For the Bravo Team, Richard Aiken is the communications expert. He's very positive and acts as the radio man for both units. Rebecca Chambers is the youngest member at only 18 years old, but has extensive knowledge of medicine and first aid. She's eager to please, but acts a bit nervous. Enrico Marini is the Bravo team leader and has concerns that Chris or Barry will end up replacing him, but he's dedicated and proud to lead when Wesker lets him. Forrest Spire is an excellent sniper, a professional, and has respect from his team. He has become good friends with Chris. And finally, Kenneth J. Sullivan is an expert chemist and a very talented field scouting expert. I like that you get a little background for all of these characters here. If you're going into the game completely blind, you have no idea who you're going to find, who will live or die, or what the eventual status of everybody will be. This helps to give them a little more characterization. But alright, it's time we check out the game proper. 
The intro is about three and a half minutes long, but I feel like I have to play the entire thing. It's pretty legendary. Okay, let's do this. Alpha Team is flying around the forest zone, situated in northwest Raccoon City, where we're searching for the helicopter of our compatriots, Bravo Team, who disappeared during the middle of our mission. No, I haven't found it yet. Bizarre murder cases have recently occurred in Raccoon City. There are outlandish reports of families being attacked by a group of about ten people. Victims were apparently eaten. Bravo team went to the hideout of the group and disappeared. Look, Chris! It was Bravo team's helicopter. Nobody was in it. But strangely, most of the equipment was still there. However, we soon discovered why. Three STARS members left now. Captain Wesker, Jill, and myself. We don't know where Barry is. Chris Redfield. Jill Valentine. Barry Burton. Rebecca Chambers. Albert Wesker. Resident Evil. Just wow. Perfection. If you can get past the amazing performances and my personal favorite part, the character announcements, we do get some story set up. Right away, Joseph finds a detached hand of somebody that had a gun and is soon killed by some dogs. Brad immediately takes off in the helicopter, leaving Chris, Jill, Barry, and Wesker behind to run toward a nearby mansion. But one interesting thing to note from the introductions here is that Rebecca Chambers is mentioned, so it's safe to assume at least that she is still alive. But before you start your game, you are given the choice between two characters and the story will play out differently based on your decision. If you choose to play as Chris, Barry has gone missing. If you choose to play as Jill, Chris is the one missing. In both instances, Wesker is with you as the three of you hear a gunshot from a nearby room. What is it? Maybe it's Chris. Now Jill, can you go? I'm going with you. Chris is our old partner, you know. After going through the first in-mansion door opening load screen, you enter a dining room where all you can hear is the ticking of a clock. When you leave that room, you find yourself in a hallway. 
going to the left results in what is arguably the single most iconic moment in the entire series. You see a human-like figure crouched over as you hear it take a bite out of something as blood spills on the floor. The creature slowly turns its head towards you, displaying blood all over its mouth as it makes a low, guttural sound. This is your first zombie encounter. Upon inspection of what the zombie was eating, you discover that it was Bravo team leader Kenneth Sullivan. As you head back to the main hall, Wesker and company are nowhere to be found. And thus, the game kicks off from there for you to explore the mansion. As far as the controls and gameplay goes, I mean this is absolutely base level classic Resident Evil. You see your character in the third person from various static views around the room you're in, almost as if it's through the view of a security camera. They operate with tank controls, meaning whichever direction your character is facing, up on either the D-pad or analog stick results in them walking straight in that direction. So even if you're trying to go from the top left of the screen to the bottom right, you'll still have to press up in order to walk forward. That could take some getting used to for first time players, but it eventually clicks. Combat pretty much works in the same way, except you have to stand in place. You press whichever button to ready your weapon and can sort of pivot in place to shoot or stab in the direction of enemies. And one major concept carrying over from Sweet Home is the limited inventory space. Chris begins with only six spots to hold anything, whether it be weapons, ammo, healing items, puzzle items, or ink ribbons. Jill starts with eight, but this gets more balanced by her taking more damage than Chris does. Your health is displayed on your inventory screen by the use of an ECG screen. Fine in green, caution in yellow and orange, and then danger in red. Being in danger usually means taking any more damage will result in a death. You can heal yourself with herbs and first aid sprays that you find along the way. A first aid spray will bring your health back to full, a green herb will bring you one step closer to full, a red herb does nothing on its own, but when combined with a green herb makes it a full heal, and then blue herbs cure poison. Saving in this game is meant to add more tension to the experience too. You can't just save your game at any point, you need to first have an ink ribbon, and then find a typewriter throughout the mansion. Holding on to ink ribbons takes up inventory space, so you'll need to plan wisely. Typewriters are found at specific points in the mansion, usually in safe rooms where there are no enemies. Save rooms also contain an item box, a teleporting item storage space if you need to leave some stuff behind to carry other things. Every item box you find allows you to access items you left in other ones as well. If you're playing as Chris, you'll likely be using the item box constantly, so you'll want a relatively clear path to get to them. Chris is kind of considered to be hard mode, and that's pretty much the basics. This is classic Resident Evil in its purest form, and this game can get pretty hard if you don't know what you're doing. My first time ever playing through it wasn't until many years after it came out, but I ended up quitting my game in frustration because I was too low on health and ammo, and couldn't make my way past the enemies I wasn't able to kill. Because, yeah, you are not necessarily meant to kill everything here. You're intentionally given limited ammo for your weapons, so a lot of times, running by enemies is the better route if you can do it well. This is what pretty much defines survival horror. You do always have a knife that will stay the same throughout, but it is not reliable at all. I did eventually beat this game a few years after my first time, so I have seen the OG in its entirety. I personally think Jill's campaign is the better one, and that's largely because of the amazing interactions between Jill and Barry. Because what this game is also known for, aside from kicking off the most successful survival horror game series, is the horrendous voice acting here. Wesker! Help me look for him, Jill. And don't leave this hall for the time being. Jill! <laughs> don't scare me. That's what I was going to say. Aren't you supposed to be going over the first floor, Barry? It's Forrest. Oh my god. Is that Jill? Is that voice Enrico's? Yeah? This voice acting absolutely falls into the so bad that it's good category, and I just love it. Unfortunately for this game's reputation nowadays, it's more of a comedic experience than scary. Although it can get tense at times if you're at risk of dying and losing progress. I laugh at certain line deliveries every single time. The stars are doomed. Someone is a traitor. Everything was plotted from the start by Umbrella. Huh? Ah. <sighs> Enrico! 
it's the best part of the game now. I actually own the original big box version of this game, and it's probably my favorite physical copy of any game that I own. It all feels so old school. I also have the director's cut, but I have yet to go through that one myself yet. But Resident Evil was definitely a huge success. The PlayStation version got mostly B and A grades across the board. At the time of its release, it skyrocketed to being the single best-selling PlayStation game ever. Over time, other releases took that spot, and it ended up placing as the 17th best-selling PlayStation game at a little over 5 million copies sold. It then had a Windows release in December of 1996, and it was on the Sega Saturn in July of 1997. It also received the Director's Cut version in September of 1997 for the PlayStation to help give fans something while they waited for Resident Evil 2, and then the Director's Cut DualShock version in August of 1998 to help utilize the analog stick for the controls. These featured an arrange mode where item and enemy placements were switched around to help give the players something new to experience. Also, some altered cutscenes, and the music is pretty notorious too. Everyone loves a good basement theme now and then. The game was also intended to be released for the Game Boy Color to have a handheld version, but that idea was scrapped. Whether or not this game has aged well I think is mostly dependent on how much nostalgia you have for the game itself, or for that mid to late 90s PlayStation era. There are a lot of indie horror games now that pay homage to this graphical and gameplay style, so the charm is certainly there. It doesn't tend to be the fan favorite of the original classic trilogy, but it is certainly the funniest. It's what it started that truly shows its impact. The game also brought on some toy merchandise, a Marvel comic series, and in 1998, S.D. Perry wrote a novelization version of it as part one by the name of The Umbrella Conspiracy for a seven part series. I actually just finished reading it and I gotta say, I was impressed to how faithful she made it to what you do in the game. I give that book a recommend. So next time we'll also be going two years into the future to 1998 to go right into the sequel. I'll see you all next time for Resident Evil 2. Paris Spectre will return. How about going down to check by yourself? I have a rope here. Oh, do you? Well, then I'll try to go down using the rope. Whoa! This hall is dangerous. There must be a back door somewhere. Oh, no! You must be kidding! After we've come all the way here! Ladies first! Go first, Jill! But, Chris! Give me a chance to play nice guy. And get the hell out of here. Understood? Yes, sir! Okay, I'll go first. Proceed with your own judgment. All right, can you do it? Yes, I can! Good luck. Jill, you're here too. Yes, you're here too? What do you think of it? I've been thinking something is wrong with this house. Hey, what is this? There's a page missing. Yeah, I thought about that too. Perhaps that was the most important part. <laughs> Stop it. Wesker, you're pitiful. Come with me. I'm sorry for my lack of manners, but I'm not used to escorting men. I have this. Here's a lockpick. It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich.